Once upon a time, there was a curious explorer who pondered the mysteries of the night sky. What if I told you, he began to whisper to those gathered around his campfire, that the moon is not just a celestial body, but a grand decoy meant to hide something far more extraordinary from us. A hexagon mirror projector? Listeners leaned in closer, eyes wide with intrigue. Yes, you heard that right. Imagine the moon is actually a well-crafted deception. He directed everyone's attention to a weather balloon launch video. Look closely, he instructed, pointing at an odd object in the background. Does that look like the moon to you? Let's delve deeper with some weather camera footage that will challenge your perception. In the flickering light, the explorer described the scene, painting a vivid picture with his words. You will notice three distinct elements. Firstly, the radiant sunlight. Secondly, two spherical lenses. The lens with the black dot at the center. This is the light source. The middle one acts as a spherical reflector. That's the black dot. And lastly, the one furthest back is the mirror projector. He paused for dramatic effect, allowing the information to sink in. The spherical reflector is something you've seen countless times, yet you never understood what it truly was. It has been called many names, but here in this moment, you are seeing it for what it really is. Gathered around the campfire, the explorer continued his tale, eyes gleaming with the secrets he was about to unveil. According to these patents, he began, the reflector is always positioned behind the artificial sun. This device controls the intensity and direction of the light rays. You might recognize this phenomenon as the two suns that are making rounds all over social media. Now you understand what you're really seeing. The crowd murmured amongst themselves, their curiosity piqued. As for the projector, the explorer carried on, it needs to be set at a certain distance to project a clear image. That's why you always see the moon some distance away from the sun and always in the opposite part of the sky. Imagine watching a movie, not on a nearby screen, but on a grand projector set far back to give the perfect picture. He paused, letting the wonder seep in. You can actually see the same projector that's responsible for the moon, but this time, it appears as a star. How do I know, you ask? It's simple. One day, I witnessed an aircraft flying out of the daytime moon. That spurred my curiosity, and I dove into research. Lo and behold, I found a patent called the simulation of the sun, moon, and earth. Remember those rumors about the moon being a satellite? Well, they weren't completely baseless. The explorer took a deep breath and smiled. Now, you know why you can see the moon and the sun simultaneously. Oh, and here, he said, pulling out an image from his satchel, is a picture my weather balloon captured. Look closely, and you'll see the daytime moon being projected on the mirror projector. And before I go, here's a little teaser for the next video. Remember that black dot? There's a reason it's there. Yes! Yeah! You must use science to save the next civilization. All right, y'all, I got something special for you guys. Um, check this out. So here's the moon from last night, all right? looking bright as fuck yellow looking like the sun like always so what i did differently this time i didn't use a telescope i used my phone just my camera phone i started to zoom in right once i started to zoom in i started seeing something that looked familiar so right here right i started zooming in i'm zooming in i'm zooming in a lot more and the reason why i could see it is because it's not as bright as the sun so now look at that what does that look like to y'all to me, that looks like a reflector. The only difference is it's being shielded. It's the, it looks like there's, there's a, a, another lens in front of the reflector. So when I started to lower the brightness, and this is what I get. What does that look like to y'all?
mm -hmm, a hexagon, right? That hexagon is always in front of the sun. They shield the shit out of it so we don't see it. So this whole thing right here is one big ass reflector with a lensing shield in front of the hexagon. Because the hexagon that we see every single day during the day is the sun simulator. So why is there a sun simulator hexagon in the moon? Maybe it's because it is the sun simulator. That could be it. Look at that. Look at that thing. It's so detailed. It's not It's not even funny. You got the black around it. Like it's a fucking light bulb. Like that's crazy. And look, I slowed it down. And look what this is. <laughs> that is fucking sick. I slowed it down and fucked with the settings. And this is what I get. It's like an invisible shield. That's amazing. And again, this was like two hours ago. This um, The moon was setting, right? Same thing. Same spot. Still getting yellow, right? Look at that. You can see the whole lensing system, the whole circle around the fucking moon. That's crazy. Like, what? The, they didn't, like, I wonder why they did this. Like, they didn't think we we're going to fucking, like, you know, notice. I mean, a lot of us notice this thing. And look, when I pan back out or when I zoom back out, I see a star, a really low star. To me, that looks like a projector crazy and i'm not gonna explain anymore you already know what's happening here look at this bitch look at this bitch is it supposed to be the lunar eclipse every single day apparently according to my comments people are saying that's a lunar eclipse that's a lunar eclipse okay every day i mean every night now is that how it is because i i didn't know that that bitch looks like the sunset to me so there you have it I mean, if this is not proof that they switched the days on us or the fucking moon is actually the sun simulator, I don't know what else to fucking tell you. I'm not the one going crazy. You guys are. So here's my proof that the moon is the sun simulator. We have two artificial suns up there. y'all question why is the moon now at 8 a.m and, and rising hmm the moon look full moon at that <laughs> just out right and then the sun out over there hmm that's strange this whole shit goes down during the fall fall equinox breaking news the department of homeland security have raided properties owned by musician and producer sean diddy Combe. On into the winter solstice, when you're supposed to be tapping in the energy. So they got cardinal points that they can shut you down based on you being all mad at the wrong shit. This is science. So they know when they want to divert your attention. Number one rule of mind control. If you can distract the conscious mind, you leave the subconscious mind wide open and they can make drones out of you and whatever they want to. You see what I'm saying? So the first thing they do is when you get all distracted and all riled all up, 
that's a certain amount of energy, and they can use that energy to empower them to get to the next point. Meanwhile, you're supposed to be doggone tapping into your shit. Make sure every time, winter, sum, winter solstice, summer solstice, spring equinox, fall equinox, always some shit gonna jump down. That Kamala's black grandmother that she showed us in that picture died in 1960 before Kamala was born. I can show you right now her death certificate. Let's take a look at Beryl's death certificate, which confirms. So this is a huge scandal. Just an absolutely huge scandal. Kamala Harris published in her book that she was standing next to her grandma Beryl. But Grandma Beryl died in 1960, four years before Kamala Harris was born. You lied in your book, okay? You lied in your book. That woman died in 1960, and you were born in 1964, and I find that to be extremely problematic. Like I said, I'm in these streets, just like you, Kamala. Whenever you wanna come out and tell the truth, I'm gonna be on this otherwise. You might as well come up with your storyline because I don't tend to let go when um, I have the scent of somebody who's telling a lie. Worry. I'm starting to receive some really good stories about cats, man. And man, look, man, like uh, this person uh, in my lane, I'm in my lane 369. This person said that they received a book from a friend and the, and the book came from a Catholic university and the book came in a box. They said that when they opened the box and tried to read the book, they said, they said that the cat, the cat that they owned just kept clawing at them and making sure that they didn't open this dog on book. Right. Then the person said that they returned the book and then he cleaned the house out, saged the house and cleaned it up real good. That was smart. You see, cats have this ability because like I said, a cat is a living manifestation, a four-legged living manifestation of, let me say this again, a four-legged living manifestation of the divine feminine in the flesh, whether it be male or female, its essence is of the divine feminine. This, this is what it reflects. This is why it has those magical powers. And this is why it's very sensitive to its surroundings. The cat has always been known as a spiritual protector and a spiritual warrior. Now, cats, man, now, if you have your, if, man, I don't want to go too much in this. I'm going to give you all a little at a time if you don't mind. But uh, if you have a cat in your presence that lives in within your home, and right around 12 o'clock at night, if this, if your cat starts meowing, meow, 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 right, that means that there are angels within your presence. That is the time when you are, to, either you open up the book and you start saying you some prayers, you start going into your manifestation visualizations, or do whatever, do something spiritual because the cats are letting you know that there's protection right now and this is a good time for you to put in work. Now let me tell you something else about cats. Something else, right. And, and you've seen this. Have you ever seen a cat come and stare you in your eyes and just keep looking at you right in your eyes? Yeah. What this cat is doing is he's serving your penile gland. Now, some people believe Madame Belvitsky, you know what I'm saying, I, I, whether you like the person or not, they believe that, or they, oh, they taught that cats have, have the, uh, the ability to know when your penile gland is either clogged up or damaged. So then they tell you this, this is time for you to start going into meditation. But let me tell you something that works better than meditation. Sun gazing. Now let's continue. If you do not have the sun, if they say the sun isn't out, you stare at the other natural flame. Fire. Fire gazing or flame gazing helps decalcify the penile gland. Keep that to yourself. Right. Now here, let's talk about something else about cats, man. Because someone else wanted me to talk about how cats shift in and out of dimensions. This is exactly what they do. If, like I said in the last video, if I said this, your cat can be in your home and it can disappear and you won't find the cat. And then you start calling the cat and then here the puppet will show up out of nowhere. And you'd be like, I just looked there. How the hell did that cat just get back? Was it locked in the closet? Was it in the basement? 
No, they're, they're running, this ship is moving in and out of dimensions. Now, if you find a spot where, you, where your cat rests at all the time, that means that that is a subtle portal. A subtle portal, not the large thing. Now, that's where it's going to take, you know, take everything, you know what I'm saying? But it's a subtle portal, meaning that this is a doorway in which your spirit can go in and out. Because you could look at your cat, and your cat will physically be sleeping there in that spot. And you still see the cat physically, but the essence of the cat has gone on to other dimensions, just like when you and your dream realm. That's why those spots where you see your cat, uh, particular spots where your cat rests all the time, that's where you go and meditate. That's where you set up your pillow and put in your work, man. Hey, but look, man, hey, I like all the comments, man. So let's keep this thing going, man. And I know, man, I'm, I know I'm a man, you know what I'm saying? I'm supposed to be a dog person, you know what I'm saying? But I, I don't need something around me that's going to kiss my ass. <laughs> I like them finicky cats, man. I'm out. Two moons is a huge sign. You're all hearing about the extra moons that's supposed to be coming in and all this and that. But I've been talking about this shit. But let's get into it. You see where it says Nibiru will rise with the sun at sunrise in the east. And it will look like a new star in the heavens. But as the days go by, it will grow bigger and bigger and eventually eclipse the sun. Right? They say it is, a, it is a planet larger than Jupiter and red in color. It has a comet-like tail of debris. It also has moons, okay? It has ushers, y'all. It has moons accompanying it, right? So you think this is by mistake? Hold on. Y'all see the red skies. The heavens will burn brightly and redly. There will be a copper hue over the face of the earth, and it is, followed by a day of darkness. Don't know when that's coming. A new moon, a new moon will appear and break up and fall, right? This is just the beginning of the destruction. People will scatter in madness because they're going to hear that loud screeching trumpet noise they already hearing. They will hear the trumpet, the battle cry of the destroyer. <laughs> like a sheriff of part two. Pain travels through families until someone is ready to feel it. For many of us, our generational curse is avoidance. We come from people who just act like it didn't happen, but pain demands to be felt. And somewhere along the line, a child will be born whose charge it is to feel it all. These are your shamans, your priests and priestesses, your healers. You call them mental health patients and label their power as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder and the like. But these are the ones who are born with the gift of feeling. And as we all know, you can't heal the pain that you refuse to feel. Here we go again, folks. Another timeline shift, and this one might be the biggest yet. By the end of this month, Earth will suddenly have a second moon. They're calling it a mini-moon, but something about this feels off. We've had one moon for as long as we've known. Now, out of nowhere, we're getting another one, and people are just accepting this? No questions, no pushback, no deep dives into the why. CERN has been messing with our reality for years, and it's no coincidence that these shifts are becoming more frequent. How long until they tell us we've always had two moons? That our history books were wrong, or better yet, misremembered? This is the manipulation of reality at work, and most people don't even realize it. We've seen them change small details before. But now they're playing with things on a cosmic scale. The timeline's shifting, folks. It's slipping, and they're rewriting it while we sleep. Pretty soon, our kids will open their textbooks and see two moons like it's always been that way. And you know what? Most people will buy into it, just like they do with everything else. They're twisting reality in front of our eyes, and only the awake can see through the cracks. Stay alert. Question everything. If they can rewrite our skies, what's next? Some folks are saying there is a black girl out here impersonating me. I can't understand why anyone would do that. Why would she do that? How can you impersonate someone who's an original? I'm the original, the big Don Dada, as some might say. There is Don Jr., but he's after me. And I said, even then, why name him Don Jr.? What if he's a loser? We don't like losers. We win bigly.
okay? Big winners. And some say, you're so racist. There's no possible way that someone who's black, a black person, could imitate me. How is that even possible? I'm not even black, I'm orange. So weird. They're eating the dogs, eating the cats. I think that's crazy. I've had a little cat in my day. Not that kind. Teflon Don is what they will call me. They've tried to get me in so many charges and none of them stick. And some say, hey, you have 34 felonies. Fake news, okay? Those felonies aren't real. None of it's real. And when I'm president, I'm gonna be the first person that I pardon, okay? And all my friends. He came against Rudy Giuliani. He's a good guy, a swell guy. He's always been there for me. He's helped me to get out of legal problems. I like that about him. I have a lot of legal problems. Two, three. Oh, that was good. That was amazing. How do you guys feel? Figure, look at this. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Oh, would you look at this? Just look at it. Just look at it. Yeah, well. What the heck is that? How do you feel about the situation that did here? Uh, let's say this. Something else is going on. They raid, They didn't raid. They searched with a warrant his premises on the West Coast, right? They searched his premises on the East Coast in Florida, right? On the same property that the premises was located that they searched in Florida, he had a second mansion. They didn't touch that one. Why not? And when they walk out of there, they got a small trash bag and they have a medium-sized cardboard box. What was it they seized that would fit into those items? I have a sneaking suspicion from my background in criminal defense that what they seized was some evidence that was very incriminating to other people. Now, after they seized the evidence, they had no probable cause to arrest him on any crime. He hasn't been indicted. They talked to him at an airport before he got on a private jet to fly to an island that has no extradition agreement with the United States. Have you heard anybody trying to prosecute him? Not at all. So what did they do? See, the feds are interesting. Who served the search warrant? Homeland Security. Now, what the hell do they have to do with that? That's a FBI mandate. Throw back to 2020 when this happened. We've got 2024 here. You can see this for, and this is from the package that I just purchased. This is from 2020. This is 2015. This one is 2014. And this one I'm about to open is from 2009. So I'm gonna open on this side because I don't want to mess up that date. This is the old applicators before they switched everything to plastic. Let's just measure before we do anything. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you cannot tell me that this is not different. You cannot tell me that this is because they switched to a plastic applicator. This is not just because it switched to a plastic applicator. These used to be bigger. Are you kidding me? It's all of them by a huge margin. That is not even a small amount. Let's look at the diameter. This is the one that I just purchased. What?
This is not even close. For reference, the current ones, I was having to take this all the way down. It's smaller than any ring size, so it's at about like the, just past the Z. Maybe if I tighten it all the way so there's nothing showing. It's just after the I. And this one from 2020. It's a little bit bigger, so I'm going to just size it up a bit. Make sure it's nice and tight. So just after the Z. Yeah, nice and tight, just after the Z for 2020. Again, this is not scientific, but this is what we've got. So this is what we're doing. Nice and tight, just after the Z, also for 2015. Twenty fourteen, a little tight, but still working out just fine. Let's see if this fits. <laughs> nope. Okay, now let's pull it tight. Okay, so we're at about the S, and we can still move it. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> actively harming it by trying to keep it so small. So let's just, I'm going to try and tighten it. It's tight. That's how round it is. And there is no question, even before I measure, that this is longer than every single other year. These are too small for the smallest ring sizer. So I grabbed the smallest possible size that we could try and they go right through. So it's not very easy to get a good distinction for most of these. This, you know, they're a little bigger, it's a little tighter, but it's still able to move. On the one from 2024 to 2020, this one from 2015, same story. 2014, again, it's a little harder to move it, but it's still possible, and not even close. Not even close. Let's see. This is a one and it will just slip over it. So that's two sizes. Again, this is not scientific, but without them communicating with us about what's going on, we don't have a lot of ways of comparing this. Let's do this side so we can be more more precise. So we're at, I would say that's accurate to be at this four and a half centimeter mark. Yeah. Look, 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 look at this. Somebody come look at this. Look at this. Somebody come and look at this. Relative to its look at this. In our country. And like many other issues, we're going to be deciding on November 5 what kind of a country we're going to be. And it applies to this issue as well. President Trump had withdrawn the U.S. from the WHO. And, of course, the Biden administration, like every other disastrous decision they made, reversed those policies when uh, the Biden-Harris administration got in charge. Well, later this week, the U.N. is going to hold a 
quote, summit for the future. And they're going to produce, this is right from their website, an intergovernmentally negotiated, action-oriented pact for the future with a chapter on transforming global governance. Ascending beyond the powers being sought by its subordinate agency, the WHO, the UN is seeking even broader and more powerful authority, as you will hear a lot about today. The Biden-Harris administration apparently intends to fully support the surrender and compliance of the U.S. to the U.N. in these endeavors. They are aligned with, aligned with the international globalists that hate America, that hate the Constitution, that hate our founders, that hate our founding Judeo-Christian principles, and they want America to become like the rest of the world. They don't want us to be subordinate to or governed by our Constitution. No, they want America to be subordinate to and governed by the UN, the World Health Assembly, and the WHO. And in fact, they intend to join with others at the UN summit this week to vote to award additional powers to the UN Secretary General. They seek to facilitate the evolution of the UN from an international cooperative body to an international governing body. These powers would be triggered by any one of a number of so-called global emergencies, whether it was a so-called climate emergency, a health emergency, a cyber emergency, or a gun violence emergency, whatever that's supposed to be, a financial emergency, or whatever they deem appropriate. And the Biden-Harris administration is in full agreement with the UN and the WHO on efforts to place us under their authority and to require such things as their international health regulations, including the surveillance of U.S. citizens, the censoring of dissenting views, and much more. The American people didn't vote for this, and they don't support this, and it's up to the people's representatives, that's us gathered here today, to have a responsibility to expose this and to reject this. The U.S. should defund the WHO again. We should withdraw from the WHO. Any agreements with the WHO or the U.N. should require Senate approval or disapproval. And a bipartisan House majority voted to require Senate approval just last week with Tom Tiffany's bill on the House floor. So I'm proud to be joined here by my House colleagues and others who are appropriately concerned and educated, informed, and leading on this issue. Again, this is the most important issue that's getting the least amount of attention relative to its importance and its impact on our country and on the American people. And with that, I yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Ralph Norman. Thanks, Congressman Good. Um, I want to thank Frank Gaffney, Tony Perkins, all my colleagues for taking a lead role in this. As Congressman Good, Good said, this is probably, other than our financial crisis this country's in, the most important issue to call attention to. Uh, the summit of the future will happen on September 22nd, 23rd. And folks, what that will do is cede America's authority, America's sovereignty to basically China. China is defined as a developing country. It is the number two economy behind America. It's not developing. It will cede our decision-making ability to China. That's what you need to know. Let me read out what uh, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, his policy brief two issued on March of 2023. I propose that the General Assembly provide the Secretary General and the United Nations system with a standing authority to convene and operationalize automatically an emergency platform in the event of a future complex global shock of sufficient scale. Guess who determines that? The, the World Health Organization. It, it reveals in their definition a possible global, comp, a global shock, including large scale climate or environmental events determined by who? The Secretary General. Future pandemics, we all noticed, all endured what the uh, problem we had with the latest virus. High impact events involving a biological agent determined by who? The World Health Organization. Disruption of uh, global flows of goods determined by who? Not America, but the WHO under the Secretary General. Not only that, it requires a 5% payment by the United States every year of our total medical dollars spent, which are in the trillions. Bottom line, we cannot let this go. This is a top line 
issues that America must be made aware of. It's got to go through the Senate where it requires 60 votes. And we're going to fight to make sure all Americans know what's happening and stop it dead in its tracks. The WHO needs to be defunded. Needs to be do away, we need to do away with it and America get out of it. I now call on Frank Gaffney with the Sovereignty Coalition. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you to all of those present. I wanted to most especially thank those who voted last week for H.R. 1425, which did exactly what Congressman Norman just talked about, requires the United States Senate to advise and, I hope, dissent on the kind of surrender of our sovereignty to global government that is envisioned both with respect to the World Health Organization and with respect now to the UN. That's, make no mistake about it, the agenda of the UN Summit of the Future. That is unmistakably what they hope to put in train with their so-called Pact of the Future. And the thing that is absolutely infuriating about all of this is not only, as these uh, gentlemen have said, this is really important. And most people in the media, most people in government, certainly the vast majority of Americans have no idea this is even going on, let alone reading in the rest of us. So it seems to me that what is needed now is not only to have the Senate charged, as with the World Health Organization's International Health Regulation Treaty, also the Pact for the Future. There must be no application of whatever they come up with in terms of world government by the UN Secretary General without the Senate's advice and consent. And secondly, I call here today on former President Donald Trump to use his platforms to address and draw out his opponent, the Vice President of the United States, on whether or not she supports world government. And if she doesn't, for her to disavow what the Biden administration is doing right now to try to bring it about. Thank you very much. Next up is Andy Big. Thank you, Frank, and thanks to uh, Bob and, and Ralph uh, for organizing this and for all the who are standing with us and my colleagues and uh, those who are concerned about this. You know, um, this administration has attacked United States sovereignty since day one. They've done it by attacking our geographical integrity, and now they want to cede our sovereignty over to the United Nations, and in particular, the World Health Organization. It's important to understand that how critical it is that we met, let the American people know how dangerous this administration is and their policies are. So, when we think about it, $850 million, that's our annual assessment today to the World Health Organization. But we consistently pay more than our assessment. Why is that? Because this administration wants to pay more. And we're the folks at the United Nations working hand in glove with the World Health Organization to have their way, we would be spending even more. And we'd be spending more to become enslaved to them because of the things that my previous uh, speakers, my uh, co-speakers have said. I introduced legislation, H.R. 2022, which gets us out of the World Health Organization and defunds our portion of it. Why is that? It's because the World Health Organization has become captured. It's been captured by our international adversary, China. We saw that as a result of the COVID-19 issue and how the World Health Organization protected Xi Jinping and the Chinese. We can't give up any more of our sovereignty, any more of our geographical integrity, any more of our economic integrity to foreign actors who have no concern about the United States of America other than to take our power and our money away. This administration is all in for it. That should be enough to tell everyone that this is a non-starter. I appreciate my colleagues for helping raise this today. I appreciate you and the media being here today because this will be a go an ongoing effort. The, an ongoing effort as the out of control spending that Congress is engaged in, coupled with the border problems that we have, let's at least not turn over our healthcare apparatus 
to folks from a, a, a United Nations or an international multilateral institution, that has no concern for us. So I thank you for being here. And now I yield to the gentlelady from Wyoming, my friend Harriet Haggins. Thank you. In my home state of Wyoming, we have common sense, something that seems to be sorely lacking in the Biden-Harris administration. Wyomingites that I have spoken with consistently ask why this administration would push to fund any organization that has clearly come under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. They wonder why Biden and Harris would try to enter into unconstitutional agreements with foreign entities that would force Americans to give up their sovereignty. It is worth noting that the bulk of the WHO's budget comes from voluntary contributions from multiple countries and organizations. Throughout the past decade, the United States has donated billions of taxpayer dollars, making us the WHO's largest financial contributor. Over this time, the CCP has exerted an expanded influence and corrupted the organization's data, research, and information sharing. Despite its abject failure, the organization is seeking greater control and greater funding while continuing to block legitimate investigations into the origins of COVID-19. On June 1st, the accord that amended the international health regulations was adopted by the World Health Assembly. While there are many concerning aspects of this accord, with its ceding of our sovereignty being at the top of the list, it's, uh, it obligates member states to address misinformation and disinformation. The result would be something that we have become all too familiar with under this administration, mandating, censoring, and sanctioning of speech and other actions that are at odds with the WHO Director General's deliberations. Of course, this is a clear violation of our constitutional rights, but Biden and Harris have never cared much for those. I have co-sponsored legislation introduced by Congressman Chip Roy, the No Taxpayer Funding for the World Health Organization Act, which would prohibit the U.S. from making any assessed or voluntary contributions to the WHO. International law does not trump the Constitution. Biden and Harris may be, may be compromised by the CCP, but they cannot force Americans to follow laws and regulations not passed by our own federal government. Thank you. And with that, I cede to Ronnie Jackson. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to start by saying as the physician, as a physician who's followed the WHO for many years now in my time in government during three presidential administrations, and now as my time as a member of Congress, I can tell you that the WHO in particular and the UN in general do not represent what's best for this country. In fact, they do everything they can to undermine us and defeat us. Look at what happened during COVID as a perfect example. During COVID, they lied to us and they worked with China to cover up the origins of COVID. You have to ask yourself, do you really want next time this happens for the WHO to decide how taxpayer dollars in this country are spent to decide what resources we are and are not eligible for, despite the fact that we overwhelmingly fund their operations. That's what you're asked. That's what you're going to get. And as my colleague, uh, Mr. Good pointed out, they can define an emergency in any way they want. And believe me, it will be creative and it won't be a health care crisis again next time. It'll be something related to the climate or gun control or some other woke agenda that they have on their radar. This IHR treaty is nothing more than a redistribution of wealth and government control via global governance. This fits right into the communist and socialist ideology that, that defines today's Democrat party in this country. Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and their administration would like nothing more than to pass their responsibility to protect this country's health and livelihood to another country, many of which do not appreciate the, the United States, do not like the United States, and many of which are hostile to the United States. They would love nothing more than to pass this responsibility to these countries. I am a firm believer, a firm believer, that from this point forward, we should never give another penny to the World Health Organization. They have not represented us well. They never have, and they never will. They are not an ally to this country. They are not an asset to this country. We should not be paying hard-earned taxpayer dollars for their efforts that are mo oftentimes against us. With regards to the United Nations, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I think the best thing we could do for the United Nations is to go to New York and push the entire thing off into the East River. And with that, I turn it over to Tony Perkins from the Family Research Council. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Well, we're here today to rain on uh, the WHO's parade as they uh, march for power. 
I, I think the WHO, if we were here about six months ago, similar press conference prior to their June meeting in Geneva where they tried to gain international support for their pandemic accord, which they did not do. And, I, and I'm, I'm becoming convinced that the WHO thinks that the rest of us have brain fog from COVID and they're just going to keep trying this over and over again. But the facts do not change. This is a global power grab. And when you look at the, the various aspects that this would touch, in particular that have been touched on that are very concerning is their focus on so-called disinformation. What we recently saw in Brazil with X is a prime example of what governments would be doing being empowered by the WHO's pandemic accord, calling on governments to silence and censor dissenting voices. You know, in America, we cherish the First Amendment. We cherish our freedom and we cherish our families. Both are endangered under this pandemic accord. And I echo the calls here today, number one, to defund the WHO and get the United States out of it. But secondly, any, any agreement that is advanced by this administra administration signed on to should be submitted to the Senate for ratification and be treated as it is as a treaty. So I thank these members of Congress for continuing to bring attention to this. While many ignore it, the WHO continues their march for power and they will not stop. And it's going to be incumbent upon this Congress, this institution, stopping and protecting the American public from the WHO. And with that, I turn it over. Is Chip here? Reggie, Little John. Reggie Little John, co founder of Sovereignty Coalition and president of Anti Globalist International. Thank you to Representatives Bob Good and Ralph Norman and my other colleagues here, including my co-chair, uh, Frank Gaffney, for organizing this press conference. 1425 was an outstanding victory, which can prevent uh, the de depredations of the World Health Organization from moving forward without Senate consent, but we need a, an equally strong measure in, in respect to the United Nations. The United Nations Pact for the Future is going to be the deliverable at the Summit for the Future, which is this weekend, and nobody knows about it. So in the Summit for the Future, they are going to approve a, a, um, a platform, an emergency platform that will operationalize automatically in the case of complex global shocks. What does it mean to operationalize automatically? It means that once they have passed it through the United Nations, they don't have to ask other countries to approve it. They will just go forward with their protocols. And how did they approve this? It's being adopted by something called the silence procedure. The silence procedure, this is a pact. A pact is a form of treaty. It's supposed to go through the ratification process internationally. Instead, they're doing it where they submit a draft and if nobody objects to it, then it's adopted. Adopted, and then it's noted that it was adopted at the actual summit for the future. So. This is absolutely unconstitutional. Not only that, it's, it's against the charter of the United Nations. They are trying to expand their powers. They're doing an end run around their own ch charter through the silence procedure. We need to raise the alarm about this and we need to stop it. Thank you. Next one is Representative Eli Crane. All right, thank you guys for coming out today to cover this. I want to say thank you to uh, Congressman Good, Norman, uh, for hosting this, and my other colleagues for showing up. Um, obviously, this is a complete disaster. I'm not surprised at all that this administration is supporting it. Um, they've completely betrayed us on our southern border, and it looks like they're attempting to sell out our sovereignty once again with this agreement. I just want to read what my colleague, Congressman uh, Norman, read. Uh, this is from Gutierrez. I propose that the General Assembly provide the Secretary General and the United Nations system with a standing authority to convene and operationalize automatically an emergency platform in the event of future complex global shock of sufficient scale, severity, and reach. The key word there is authority. That's what these globalists want. They want authority. They want to strip it away 
from what we have here and the representatives that we have here that represent the people of this country, though none of them were elected by anyone in this country. And what do they want authority over? Because it's not just pan the next pandemic, all right? Large scale climate or environmental ev events. Wow, they could be real creative with that one. Future pandemics, high impact events involving a biological agent, disruptions to global flows of goods, people, or finance, Disruptive activity in cyberspace or disruption to global digital connectivity, major event in outer space or black swan events. That's enough examples and enough reasons for them to get involved pretty much whenever and wherever they want to. And I hope that this body and the Senate continues to reject, push back and stop this agreement and this push by this administration to sell out our sovereignty to globalists. Thank you. Next up is Chris Ullman, Eagle Forum. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Chris Ullman, the president of Eagle Forum. I'm delighted to be here. We're a grassroots organization of patriots who love this Constitution. Today is September 17th. Today is Constitution Day, the day when all Americans should study the Constitution and learn about it. And I am so grateful for this opportunity to have this press conference today when we're talking about the WHO and the UN and what they're trying to do to take our sovereignty away. And I'm grateful for these members of Congress who are standing up to do their constitutional duty to be the legislative branch to decide what our laws are and what laws the American people will live under. The United Nations and the WHO want to become the lawmaking body to tell us what to do. And these members of Congress last week took a step to say, no, it's our job to make the laws, not the UN and not the WHO. Uh, the Senate, there are 49 senators who have signed on to a companion bill that requires the same constitutional advice and consent. We have 26 governors who have also spoken out on this, as well as attorneys general. So we're delighted on Constitution Day that this body is taking the first step to get us back to constitutional order. Thank you very much, and now I turn it over to Representatives Norman and Good for questions. Harry, two questions. Well, I'd say what it has on future elections is bigger than that. It's what it has on the future of this country. I mean, this is a dictatorship. This is, you know, this administration, by its actions when it first took office, had executive orders that were supposed to be temporary during the term of his office, like the border. It's, you know, to reverse that, to walk that back, it's going to take a massive effort. This will take the same massive effort. If he votes this in, does not take it to the Senate, uh, we'll cede our sovereignty. We cannot do it. The American people do not want that. That's not what a democracy is all about, and particularly with China. China is our enemy, and to cede it to basically to them is unacceptable, particularly with the COVID virus. I'll just add to what Congressman Norman said, that you saw the Biden-Harris administration on full display during the China virus situation where they doubled down and took every recommendation from the WHO we had to force them, literally, the Republican House had to force them to finally end the pandemic emergency and the, the so-called mitigation uh, requirements that were in place. So hopefully the American people learn from that. They've suffered sufficiently, and they're going to make change on November 5. One more. All right. Just one, one thing to that last point. Uh, when you talk about elections, the founders had a very important insight. You want people voting who are informed. We are here to talk to you and through you to the American people to ensure they are informed because the process that we're talking about could functionally end the whole idea of limited, accountable, and representative governance in this country under our Constitution, that must not be allowed to happen. And I thank these gentlemen and their colleagues for trying to prevent it from happening.
Thank you all. Thank, Thank you all so much. Rolling like a big shot, got cleaned up and I only serve a big guy. Fresh start time.